Cool. Um, so just a note about clouds. Uh, remember, it's not a cloud. It's somebody else's computer. So. Uh, my name is Benjamin Brown. My day job is at Akamai Technologies at their um, CERT, their Security Intelligence Response Team. Uh, my focus is mostly dark web research, cybercrime, um, underground economies, uh, and uh, I also am the liaison for all of our law enforcement interactions. When we get a subpoena or we get a uh, foreign law enforcement request, I'm the one that works with them to understand how Akamai works, what we do and don't keep, those sorts of things. Um, and uh, I also do advanced CISSP training. I do not have a CISSP. Uh, I also do incident response and get to be a chaos monkey around the company, just breaking shit and then helping them fix it and make it more resilient in the future. And I don't tell them that I'm going to do it before I do it. All right, so if we're going to talk about cryptocurrencies, we need to talk about blockchains. Uh, these are essentially distributed digital ledgers, uh, ledger in the financial sense. And uh, blockchains, when I say distributed, um, I'm not talking about centralized and I'm not talking about decentralized. Centralized is going to be more like the fiat banking, um, where if you're going to send a money order or something, it has to be from your bank and you have to do that operation there with them. Uh, in a decentralized, um, it's more like this model here, um, where there is there are some nodes of centrality. Uh, but it is not distributed in the sense that every node has a full copy um, of the ledger and what's going on. And that's not true of all cryptocurrencies. Some do not keep full ledgers because of scaling issues, um, but the vast majority of them, each node will keep a full ledger. Uh, some blockchain quick and dirty features, uh, why would we want to use them? Uh, transactions across, uh, so, it is and it isn't peer-to-peer -peer networks. It's not peer-to-peer -peer like a decentralized network. It's peer-to-peer -peer as in a, uh, a distributed network. Again, the connections, are, the connections between nodes are going to look very different. Um, all nodes, again, have a copy of the full ledger except some weird outliers. Uh, changes are consensus-based. They have to be agreed on. Um, and uh, what that does is it makes for no single point of failure for the system. Um, and it makes it much more difficult to compromise. Uh, also, you're not waiting for a central authority like you have to for a wire transfer or something like that, um, and you're not paying out uh, outrageous fees, which is great. Uh, transaction history is stored indefinitely. Um, of course, that's not actually true because, you know, heat death of the universe and all of that. Uh, but uh, transactions can't be altered after verification. Um, as the security model stands now. I'm not saying that that's going to be true in the future, but that's what we're trusting now. Uh, and uh, cryptography and digital signatures are pretty much the basis for the security of uh, the transactions and the record integrity itself. All right, so um, for cryptocurrencies in general, a lot of advocates are very quick to say, like, this is going to get rid of fiat, you should be using this alone. I don't think the maturity is there yet for these systems to say that. Um, so that's just my personal take on it. And uh, what cryptocurrencies are are digital assets or mediums of exchange that sit on top of the blockchain technology. Um, and uh, there are hundreds of different cryptocurrencies. Um, and most are based on the blockchain technology. Uh, here's just a few of them. Uh, my personal favorite is Coinye. That's the Kanye coin. Um, and I thought it was hilarious that he was really, really angry about it. Um, probably because it's got him as a fish on it, looking derpy. Um, he likes fish sticks, I hear. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the best coin. And then, of course, the best one after that is Dogecoin. Um, so how does mining work in cryptocurrencies? Mining, a, a lot of the terminology with cryptocurrencies and blockchain, I think we're horribly named, and their name already is in use, and it's overloaded, and it gives people the wrong idea. But for mining, essentially what it is is record-keeping services for the ledger. Um, and uh, miners will repeatedly verify and collect newly broadcasted transactions, and you can give miners an extra incentive to take yours earlier or faster. Um, and uh, there are, um, why it's called a blockchain, of course, is there are a series of blocks chained together, and to um, 
have an alteration in one block, you have to also alter all subsequent blocks because they link back to the previous ones. So it's, a, it's another level of uh, security for compromise there, against compromise, rather. Wallets, another term that should not be called wallets. Uh, it, it's not a wallet in a sense like you open it and there's your currency. Uh, a wallet is more like um, a, a key ring. It holds your credentials that are tied to cryptocurrency holdings. Um, it could, they have uh, hardware wallets. Uh, there are some really cool ones. I think Trezor is doing them, uh, as well as a couple other outlets. Um, software wallets, uh, there are hot and cold software wallets. Um, hot wallets, uh, the, especially ones you keep with a cloud company, um, I would not suggest holding any large amount or really any amount unless you're actively using it. Um, there are also <laughs> engraved metal wallets that have a cute little QR code on them. Um, and then paper ones with QR codes. Those are the ones you typically get from Bitcoin ATMs. Um, and then there are brain wallets where it's not kept anywhere on paper or on software and you just keep the mnemonics in your head to be able to know what your key is. Um, I would not suggest that because people that do that typically tend to choose not very safe keys. So, um, also they can be generated on the fly. All right, addresses, not the same as wallets. Addresses, they represent the public side of your key pair. And the private half is what you keep in your wallet. Um, and transactions between addresses are kept in the distributed ledger. That's when, when you actually go to blockchain.info or Blockseeker or something like that, what you're looking at is the transactions between addresses. All right, now Bitcoin, the 800-pound gorilla, or I guess 5,000-pound gorilla now. Uh, it was released in 2009. Um, no Newsweek, we do not know who actually released it. Uh, and, and it was the first decentralized digital currency. Um, there were digital currencies before, like eGold and iGolder and uh, a few other different ones. Um, none of them are really extant anymore um, because they got shut down for being an alternative to fiat, essentially, but also money laundering. Uh, but uh, it's the largest by market value. It has, again, an open ledger, um, which means full transaction visibility. And we'll talk about the security or privacy implications of that in a little bit. This is an example of somebody's design for a paper wallet for Bitcoin. Now, when I say it's an open ledger, before, as I was talking about blockchain.info, which is one of many sites where you can go to view the ledger in a human readable output, um, this is an example of some transactions uh, that you can look at. And you can click on the different addresses, and it'll take you to the next transaction in the chain. Um, so another thing that's happening with the places that you would go to buy or sell Bitcoin um, and exchange it for fiat currency um, is they are being um, pressured heavily by governments um, and institutions to um, know their customers um, and to engage in anti-money money laundering um, policies. Um, and part of that is they are requiring identity uh, from whoever's signing up for an account with an exchange. Uh, and it's getting crazier, for sure, uh, because now, um, like Coinbase, arguably the largest exchange for Bitcoin, uh, they make you hold up your passport next to you while you're doing a live camera feed with them, uh, and then they give you something to say or uh, uh, something to verify that this isn't like pre-recorded, uh, and it's, it's, it's nuts. Oh, by the way, there are people in other countries that you can pay to do this for you with uh, stolen IDs. See my talk Friday about that. All right, Bitcoin tumbling, one of the methods of obfuscation. Note I said obfuscation, not anonymizing. Um, with Bitcoin tumbling, what happens is there's a tumbling service where you put in your quote unquote dirty Bitcoin and uh, they've got some Bitcoin in reserve. There are other people also putting Bitcoin into the tumbling service, mixed all up, create a whole bunch of different addresses and then um, shunt different amounts to those addresses and then give you a subset of that, which are now obfuscated coins. Here's an example of one of the largest ones, Helix. Um, and uh, just something to point out here that I think is hilarious 
is the add random timing delay and send in multiple transactions are not turned on by default. Uh, so it makes it so much easier to do forensics or to trace Bitcoin transactions um, if, you're, if you have a constant timing delay um, that you know what it is uh, and it's not sent in multiple transactions. Here's an example of a section of a Helix tumbling event. Um, and as you can see, using a tool called Numisite, um, in a tree view, uh, it's, if you put the time in, it's not difficult to tell where the money's going with tumbling. It just takes some time. Uh, the guy who built Numisite, that tool you just saw, Dan O'Farron, uh, he also has a preliminary field guide for Bitcoin transaction patterns which is great if you want to start learning um, how to do Bitcoin transaction forensics uh, yourself. Um, also, Sarah Meeklejohn, I'm a total fanboy. Her research is amazing. Um, she does a fistful of Bitcoins, which has just been recently updated, um, where she does characterizing uh, payments, Bitcoin payments, among men with no names who are trying to stay anonymous and are most likely engaged in criminal activity. Also, as a bonus, there's been research that came out uh, this year um, that uh, has a system for using third-party vendor cookies um, or trackers for vendors that accept Bitcoin um, as a breadcrumb trail to trace back your historical transactions um, and identify you on the blockchain. So, not anonymous. So again, I really want to stress obfuscation does not equal anonymity. So. Next time someone tells you that Bitcoin is anonymous, just right in the throat. Because either they have no idea what they're talking about or they're trying to sell you something. Litecoin, this is the baby gorilla. Litecoin was released in 2011. It's a fork of the actual Bitcoin code base. Uh, it was actually a guy at Google who wanted to learn more about cryptocurrencies. So as a hobby, um, he forked the Bitcoin code base um, and it ended up blowing up as Litecoin. Uh, and one main difference is it uses script in instead of SHA-256, like Bitcoin. Um, otherwise, it's the same and has the same privacy issues. Open ledger, lots of different ways to do forensics to trace transactions. Ethereum, one of the ones I'm most excited about, um, because Ethereum in and of itself isn't a cryptocurrency. It's a distributed computing platform that you then build distributed applications on top of, one of them being a cryptocurrency. It was released in 2015. Uh, it is uh, more extensible than Bitcoin for sure, uh, but uh, one of the really cool features is it's a Turing complete virtual machine uh, used to develop these de decentralized apps. Um, and uh, I expect to see some really, really cool things coming out of Ethereum. Um, and uh, why a lot of people would want to possibly build an app on top of it is it allows for them to be highly resistant to downtime because of the, uh, the way the nodes are set up. Um, also censorship resistant for takedowns, uh, fraud resistant, and um, for third party interference, um, there is not a whole lot of options for them to be able to uh, take over an app or push it off the network. In terms of privacy, it has a public ledger. The cryptocurrency was not built with privacy in mind. Um, you can implement ZK snarks, which we'll talk more about uh, that later, uh, for a primitive mixing contract, but um, it's, it's still traceable based on the initial uh, creation. Um, there's also uh, the laundromat um, application that is being developed. Um, this is contract-based mixing service, um, and it uses ring structures, but ring structures, as we'll see later with Monero, um, at least in this implementation, um, do have some forensic weaknesses. Darkcoin, or now it's called Dash. It's been around a while, um, and it has some quasi-privacy stuff that you can do with it. Um, but it's optional and not by default. It's the fifth largest market value. Um, it was the first decentralized autonomous organization. Um, and what that means is the governance for the cryptocurrency itself um, is not, it, there isn't a central board or a central committee or a group of programmers that decide everything that happens. Um, it's a decentral, decentralized governance for the whole network 
and different nodes, uh, they all get their say in what happens to the, uh, the network and to the code. Um, and for proof of work, it uses X11, which is another difference. And uh, there is options for privacy using private send. Um, it's based on another privacy-oriented um, service called CoinJoin. It just extends it a little further. Um, and it only accepts certain amounts, 1, 10, 100, et cetera. Um, and the reason they would do this is because it makes it harder to trace. Um, like, if you had a unique number, like 156, it would stand out a lot more than some basic number like 1, 10, 100, something like that. Um, it combines uh, these identical inputs from multiple users into a single transaction, which makes input-output analysis more difficult. Um, and it has distributed master nodes instead of a single website. Here is their um, IPv6 and Tor master nodes. Um, this is as of uh, four months ago. There are a few more master nodes, and there's a lot more planned. Um, so the distribution is uh, a globally distributed, which is important in doing uh, timing attacks uh, in terms of forensics uh, between nodes. Um, when you have nodes that are, uh, like you have one node in a country that's far away from the next closest node, um, then based on the timing of confirmations, um, you can use that with other metadata um, to trace transactions. Um, the Finnish government is doing some really cool stuff with that for Bitcoin. Uh, Monero, this is like the new up and riser, the new kid on the block that is just blowing up. Um, it is privacy oriented, but their early implementations had issues. Um, it is the, I would say now it's probably the fourth largest, um, but it is the fastest growing. Um, it was built with privacy in mind, and can you tell at what point uh, darknet markets started accepting Monero? Yeah, that was in September 2016, uh, and the value just exploded from there. Uh, so it uses the crypto note protocol for blockchain obfuscation. Again, it's obfuscation. Um, ring structures were, uh, basic ring structures were used in the initial implementation. Um, ring CT is now used, uh, but uh, we'll talk a little bit later about problems with that. Uh, it uses stealth addresses to hide the receiving address. Um, it has planned I2P uh, integration, and uh, it'll use that to hide the transaction origin nodes, which obfuscates, again, doing things like timing forensics between nodes. Um, also, uh, one of the things that's uh, interesting about this when compared to, say, Zcash is the memo field, because you can send notes with your transactions. The memo field itself is not hidden or encrypted or anything like that, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, a significant number of transactions between 2014 and 2016, um, they can be linked, uh, and uh, again, that degrades privacy because using that set of linkages um, with other metadata, you can then um, uncover either who it is or um, what their activity has been. Um, and uh, it's not new. Um, we've known about these issues with that particular ring structure, uh, but uh, there are new tools that make it easier for people to um, exploit that issue. There's a website you can actually go to to view a lot of these issues. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, something I do want to note about this research and these tools, they were put out by people who are on the board for Zcash. So there was uh, some incentive there. Uh, the new Ring CT um, structures, uh, these are, are much better, much stronger, um, and they address a lot of the issues of the previous usage. Um, and uh, again, um, you want to keep in mind who was doing the research and what was behind uh, their drive. Um, also worth noting, people on the board for Monero have also put out research um, sniping both Ethereum and uh, Zcash. So there's a lot of back and forth going on. Because in academia, you know, the stakes are so low, so the politics are very, very high. I don't know if any of you have worked or done research in academia, but it's a political nightmare. Uh, so Monero also has something that's like local bitcoins. Has anybody here used local bitcoins? Okay, so what that does is it allows you to find 
um, other individuals and meet up with them to do a Bitcoin transaction so you're not using um, sort of a website or any sort of uh, digital third party that could then be used to reveal information about you. Then again, you're meeting a total stranger. So there's that. Uh, but uh, this local Monero, it does the same thing. It helps you hook up with people that want to in-person buy and sell Monero. Uh, but it also has an online version where you can pay through PayPal, kind of sketchy, uh, gift cards, really sketchy. Um, you can also pay with like uh, PlayStation points uh, and stuff like that, which, I mean, it's obvious they're money laundering. Like, that's why they're doing it. Zcash. Um, I really like where this is going, and the researcher behind it is great. Uh, it was released uh, last year. It was built with privacy in mind, um, and the CEO and main uh, researcher behind it is Zuko Wilcox O'Hearn. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Tahoe Least Authority File Store, um, but it's a distributed, um, protected, privacy-oriented file storage service. Uh, he also wrote the ZRTP protocol and the Blake2 cryptographic hash function. Um, I think, where's, where's the Hashcat guy? He probably knows all about that. <laughs> but um, this guy, he, I mean, he's really respected and known um, in the crypto world. He knows what he's doing, so it's good to have his name behind this. Um, and the, uh, the ZK that's behind this is ZK Snark. Um, you can actually go to their website and read the white paper, the research on it. Uh, if you want to dig down into the dirty details, um, it's nice that they provide that. Uh, there are some issues with the way in which they've set up their service and their company. Zcash miners pay a 20% genius tax to the owners. First of all, why would you call it a genius tax? Second of all, 20%? Are you kidding me? That's like mafia percentages there. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, they're probably going to learn soon that that's not going to work out for them. Also, uh, it's had a lot of uh, investor speculation. If you look at the history of it since it's come out, it's just been all over the place, like ridiculously high numbers and then just drops down to the basement. Um, it's starting to sort of level out and do this, uh, but uh, we'll see how that goes in the future. Um, oh, also uh, something of note, um, all of the people on their team uh, are academics, like they really need a good marketing team, they need good salespeople, they need uh, people who actually know business. So, yeah, I hope they get those. Uh, and another thing about Zcash, uh, the shadow brokers are using it now. Uh, they moved from Bitcoin, why they ever use Bitcoin is beyond me, uh, but uh, they started using Monero and then now they've moved to Zcash. Um, does anybody not know the shadow brokers? Okay, so quick explanation. Uh, they've uh, stolen, I guess, uh, a bunch of um, tools and information from uh, government entities, um, mostly intelligence-based government entities, um, and they're selling this information. Um, and uh, you can buy different dumps. They won't tell you what they are, but based on the price, that's supposed to be how much they're worth. Uh, but uh, they're also releasing a bunch of that information for free. So you can go see their past releases, which is, is interesting if you're a red teamer, if you're a blue teamer, um, if you're a purple teamer. Uh, but uh, it, it lets you know what some of these state-backed entities were getting up to um, in terms of breaking into systems and whatnot. So yeah, questions, comments? Thank you very much for that talk. That was really interesting. I think it's one of the most easily explained way of, of how cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin work. So I um, think that's really good. Do we have any questions from, from the audience straight off of this? Also, if you want to email me, um, if you don't want to publicly say it, um, or um, on the Twitters, uh, you can also ask for my slides, and I'd be more than happy to give them to you. Yes, we have a question there. So the question was, if you were to buy stuff on the darknet, which no one would, which would be your preferred cryptocurrency? Uh, so if it was something that I wanted others to not know that I bought, um, I wouldn't. And you'll see 
partially in my talk Friday why. Um, there are just way too many areas for you to throw your privacy out the window, and OPSEC is really hard. Um, but if I had a gun to my head and I had to, um, I would probably first um, purchase in person, um, you know, with uh, local Bitcoins or with um, uh, local Monero, and then um, throw it through a whole bunch of different currencies, cryptocurrencies, just do a shuffle game there, uh, and then throw that through a bunch of online cloud wallets, um, and then from there to um, an offline cold wallet, which I would then use for whatever transactions I'm, I'm doing. Um, if I was buying something that wasn't digital, I'd probably find a house that was far away from me that I was able to tell that the people were out of town or had just sold the house and then get it dropped there. Uh, but even that has risks associated with it. So in a nutshell, I wouldn't. <laughs> okay, I have a question before we have oh, yeah, a couple sure. of more questions. Like, so, so what do you see, because you know a lot about cryptocurrency, what's the most common misconception about cryptocurrencies? Uh, that they're anonymous. I mean, really, yeah. uh, that uh, there is no way for you to be traced or uh, it really the biggest, the biggest privacy issue is when you go to cash out. I yeah. mean, if you, if you keep Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies just where they are forever and ever, amen, they're next to useless, but it's a lot more secure. But, 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 but that's also interesting because we, we now see Ethereum, we see it's being backed by IBM, mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot more like actual series play game. Do, do you think that the research in cryptocurrency, they will actually take over the, the, the micropayments or, or the payments that we normally have between banks and SWIFT going forward? So that's actually starting to happen with uh, remittances. Um, Bitcoin is being used uh, a lot for remittances between countries because um, especially if you are away from your family and you're trying to get back as much money as possible to them, those um, transfer fees are just killing you. I mean, they're a huge chunk of your paycheck. Uh, so when you can use something like Bitcoin at a fraction of the, the transaction price, I mean, it's, it's very appealing. Um, yeah. Also, countries that have um, highly fluctuating um, uh, fiat currency, like um, know, Argentina or Indonesia, something like that, um, where you can't trust that your dollars are going to be worth what they're worth from one moment to the next. Even though Bitcoin's not stable, yeah, it's I, I more agree. stable. I, I live in London. <laughs> it's like I would be better off in any cryptocurrency yes, than, in, yes. than in pound. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, okay, next question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so personally, I'd say it's too early to tell um, because both of them are using technologies that have not been around for very long, um, that haven't been really hammered on by really smart mathematicians for very long. Um, so uh, I would say time will tell, but right now, Monero is probably a better investment. Well, I won't say investment, a better speculation than Zcash. because. With cryptocurrencies, it's so new, it's not investment, it's speculation. Uh, oh, that leads me on to another question. There's been a lot of media, like all these ICOs, like they're being hacked. There's been a lot of media outlets, like, oh, all these new cryptocurrencies, especially with, with Ethereum, like being hacked oh, yeah. all the time. So what, what's your take on that? So you, you have to separate that into two major buckets there, um, between uh, core issues, or issues with the core software um, and issues with implementation. Yeah. Um, so I would say the majority of the hacks were issues with implementation or administration of a service. Um, unfortunately, where Ethereum was concerned, it was actually issues with the core code, um, which they did rectify, but you know that does not look good. <laughs> yeah. Yes, another question? So in terms of, um, I'll answer the second one and then lead into the first one. So in terms of uh, 
of working with Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general uh, as a job, um, you're gonna, we're gonna see a large bubble for that, and then we're gonna see it shrink um, and then balance out as they mature and get to be used more. I would say any job, especially with a startup, um, that you start now doing uh, work with Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, it's gonna be a crapshoot, um, you know, if they're gonna make it in the future or not, because the bubble will burst. Um, in terms of high frequency trading, same issue with regular high frequency trading. Uh, once quantum, quantum computing matures, it's out the window. It's gone. I mean, and uh, as more and more the transaction times are um, uh, shrunk, and uh, only the largest players are the ones that can afford the cutting edge technology, they're gonna be dominating the market, and it's not gonna be worth it for smaller traders. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very good talk. Uh